Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the day that we call Black Friday. Every Black Friday, we put out three episodes. I have an episode with Alan, with Gavin, and George today. It'll be a lot of fun. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and I think you should change Black Friday. It sounds very racist to an Englishman to me. What are you Americans up to? Now, over in England, you have Boxing Day, which is kind of I what I would say is the equivalent to, to our uh, Black Friday, where we just go out and we become ultra uber hyper capitalist for a day. You're going to watch videos uh, emerging here from America where people rush the doors at Walmart or Target, Best Buy, whatever, run inside, topple over displays, fight over items, showing the love and kindness that they found within them the day before, the day we call Thanksgiving, a day that was started by the Anglican Church for kicking out the Puritans and bringing them to America. Thank you for that. Uh, it just <laughs> our loss is your gain. <laughs> I, know, I scratch my head at the human condition every day. Gavin, how you been doing this week? Oh, I'm I'm I'm, I'm very well, thank you, Kevin. Yes, I'm, I'm my eye is getting better. My health is getting better. Christmas is is coming. Um, uh, all all is good. Thank God. Yes. All right. So, uh, from time to time, we have to update reports that we've done in the past. Um, when you first joined our program a couple of years ago now, you talked much about the uh, the report going on in Jersey at the time where a bishop had made some ill-advised decisions causing more victims than uh, first appeared. Uh, and I said, at the time, this is all crazy. He said, well, you just wait for the report. And now we have a report, I think, somewhere uh, and I, I wanted to kind of talk to you, with you about it. So what's what's the latest update with Jersey? The report you're talking about is called the, the Dame Heather Steele report. She was a high court judge brought in to do a second report after the first report was thought to be fallible. Um, the, the, the fact, essentially what this is about is the Church of England uh, not being transparent and not doing safeguarding properly when it's not in its own interests. I thought it was over-transparent because they put the first report out into the public domain about this. Why don't we just back up a little bit uh, for 30 seconds and, and tell the story about what the report is about. There was a, a distressed, uh, vulnerable adult uh, who went to live on Jersey and she joined a congregation and was uh, went to live in the church warden's house. The church warden's a kind of uh, non-ordained deacon. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, the relationship became too intimate and he hugged her inappropriately. Mm -hmm. Nothing more than that. Um, it turned out that, that she had had this experience twice before. So uh, there was some form uh, there, uh, whatever you want to make of that. Um, the, the bishop uh decided that he would launch a report and he got a psychotherapist to trail through the emails the psychotherapist never interviewed the vulnerable safeguarding woman herself and when the report was drawn up uh, it criticized the dean what the woman had done was she'd gone to the dean and say i've been inappropriately hugged by my landlord and uh, you should what can you do to censor him and the dean said uh, you need to file a complaint and you do it by filling in these forms. Mm -hmm. uh, she declined to fill in the forms and the dean said he couldn't progress the thing unless she did. So she then went to the Bishop of Winchester at the time, the previous one, to complain that the dean had stopped her, would not entertain her complaint. Uh, she camped out in his garden in Winchester and threatened to kill herself, shortly after which the previous Bishop of Winchester had a stroke and retired. <sighs> enter, the new, enter the new Bishop of Winchester who, who reviewed the psychotherapist's report, uh, which which blamed the dean for everything. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and, and he then suspended the dean, which it turned out he had no right to because the dean was also appointed by the queen mm -hmm. and the bishop's legal advice hadn't taken that into account. Um, but, but the thing he had done was to put this report in the public domain without consulting anybody, uh, although he promised to consult everybody. So his concern for the vulnerable lady was not at the, at the highest level. It looked as though this was a political move to boot the dean out. Well, uh, the island rebelled a bit. A few truculent clergymen said this is not the way to do things. And consequently, uh, a new report was commissioned by an independent high court judge, not a third rate psychotherapist who only read emails. And, um, the, and, every, and it was promised that this report would be put in the public domain quickly. It has never appeared. 
Uh, well, I heard and, they're holding back only to change a couple things in the grammar issues, a couple commas are out of place, and that you should see this any day. Now we've seen that we've had that uh, any day now for two that, two that, and a half weeks. Well, that that was what was said originally. Now, now the, 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 hang on, this is the, the Steele report. Yes. we haven't got to the Carlisle and George Bell one yet, to, to which that does apply. Yes. So the Steele report, the, the bishop went to the court and said he he didn't want to release the report because of the vulnerable. Uh, the vulnerable young person, irrespective of the fact that he already put the first report in the public domain with no concern. So it was hard to take that seriously. But the point is, what you have is a safeguarding issue that the Church of England has not uh, progressed, is not transparent and will not be accountable for. That's that's report number one. But then now you get the opposite end of the spectrum, which is George Bell. Uh, George Bell, the most famous Bishop of Chichester, a hero during the Second World War, mm -hmm. a man about whom nothing ever improper was written, was accused um, uh, decades later by an elderly lady of uh, having sexually abused her on a staircase. Um, now, the, there are a number of things that Bishop of Chichester could have done at this point. He could have consulted George Bell's secretary, who's still alive and has, uh, who, who knew him and has a lot of uh, records, or, or the chaplain, I think, one or the other. Um, in fact, nobody was consulted. Uh, the, the woman in question, uh, poor thing, I'm, I'm sure she, I show you there's every reason for thinking she was abused. Mm -hmm. the, the only question is, was she abused by the Bishop of Chichester? Correct. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, so she was given some money, and Bishop, the Bishop of Chichester's reputation was trash. Uh, I was in the, I was in the um, a meeting when uh, of the canons of Chichester, where I once was a member, uh, when it was announced that every building that was named after him was going to be renamed. And did we have any suggestions? Uh, I, I, I piped up and said I thought we should name them Natural Justice, yes. <laughs> which uh, nobody took very seriously. Yeah. However, um, a lot of people have complained about the trashing of uh, a man's reputation after his death with no corroboratory evidence apart from one eyewitness uh, who has been apologised to by the church and she's received a financial settlement. The question is, is, it, is anybody safe if on the basis of one person's recollection 30 years later without any evidence uh, somebody can be deemed guilty uh, rather than innocent unfortunately lord carlyle was commissioned to write to look into the way in which the original report was done and he's about he's finished his report so we had expected it in july uh, and now the months are running by and it's not yet out and we're being told as a process of of uh, checking up on what everybody said. Here's the difficulty. On the website, it says, in order as a, as a statement to the witnesses, Lord Carlyle will make sure he fully understands and reflects whatever you tell him. He will make a record of any meeting with you. He guarantees to confirm the accuracy of that record with you. So somebody has written afterwards, well, in the light of that, there can't be any need for a long period of several months to elapse between the delivery of the report by Lord Carla and publication. So what's happening? Yeah. Well, we don't know what's happening, but it doesn't fill you with confidence about the Church of England's capacity or transparency or accountability when it's not in its own interests. They do have a problem with dealing with big issues that can be very dramatic uh, affecting their history. And we always call it overreaction. And I've been watching this with many different issues. And you see somebody completely trashed. And by the time they figure out what happened, they're like, oh, we overreacted. And that's just the nature of the certainly the Church of England. We see it in the Anglican Communion. And we see it over here in America all the time, especially in our government. Um, are they ever going to address the issue of overreacting, making everything too public too soon? That's, I think, the bigger issue you have with these reports. Well, I think the problem too is 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 more subtle than that. Um, mm -hmm. The diocese of Chichester uh, had a reputation for not managing, uh, not managing to deal with the abuses, sexual abuses of some clergy. Absolutely. There were a handful of very unpleasant ones, including one by by the bishop Peter Ball. Uh, whom I knew, and, and, and I was one of the people who was completely taken in by him. Um, but the feeling is that having either been taken in by some of these people or failing to act on others, uh, in order to protect them from 
uh, any criticism, they're overreacting. So the feeling is it's an, there's an element of institutional self-interest in this. Yes, sir. Well, is. you know, that's, that's not a moral quality either for any institution, but particularly not for a Christian one. Okay, let's move on to some interesting uh, international news, let's call it, uh, between uh, the Orthodox Church in Russia and the Church of England. Uh, your dear Archbishop went to visit uh, Justin Welby, sat down and uh, brought his entourage, uh, met with the Orthodox leaders, and they put out some press statements. Um, the Orthodox Church in their press statement noted that, you know, it's very difficult to criticize the current administration in Russia. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> you know, there, there's good and bad to uh, Putin and what he's been doing, but uh, the church has benefited from some of uh, Putin's actions, and the church has uh, certainly uh, uh, drawn ire from those who say, why aren't you saying anything? And then Justin Welby's team put together a statement and said, by the way, we have trouble in England criticizing our government as well. You would not believe the lengths we have to go to uh, in fear to criticize our government. And I was just thinking about the, the things they said about the Tories uh, two months ago. And I'm like, is he being serious? Uh, Gavin, as an Englishman, please tell me there's freedom of the press over there and freedom of religion and, and all those things that nobody's coming down on the Church of England for what it says. <laughs> well, there isn't, there isn't. Um, there is no, there isn't, there, the freedoms of people who want to uh, offer a traditional moral or Christian witness in society are very fast diminishing. Right. The press went printed on the whole uh, and people lose their jobs. Um, so, uh, but on the other hand, there is freedom if you want to go with the flow, if you want to big up the secular narratives, which uh, Archbishop Welby and the establishment of the Church of England are doing, then, then you're free to do that. Um, if I, I'd like to recast the um, Orthodox uh, report in a slightly different mold, if I may. Oh, no, what that's, I think, what, that's what I pay you for. Please. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I think happened was that um, the, the patriarch said to Welby, we had a great deal of trouble from our government and we found it very difficult to speak out against the Soviet government in the bad years under Marxism. But look, he said, you've got trouble too. You have secular groups, which are many people call cultural Marxist groups, uh, closing you down. And you need to speak up against them in a way, if you like, that we failed to against the Marxists under, under communism. So this is a warning to Welby from the Patriarch Kirill that uh, if the West is not careful, it will go the same way the Soviet Union went in terms of, of, of repression. And it, Welby's reply to that was well, it was extraordinary. What he said was this: Archbishop Welby acknowledged it was hard to criticise lobby groups, uh, and the Church of England, uh, enjoying the conditions of democracy, found it hard to voice criticism that appeared to be contradicting democratic political decisions. In other words, if the secularists vote for something, what right has the Church to offer any opinion at all against the will of democracy? Well, I mean, I, I, you know, at this point, I simply don't know where to start, so you better take over. <laughs> well, I mean, it, we just return to a monarchy then. We return to uh, the, the church has to uh, be subjected to the government uh, and have no say. You, you return to the how days. Is, how is it? What view of the church can you possibly have when you believe that it has no prophetic mm -hmm. witness at all in terms of, of, of uh, speaking on God's behalf into a society that's turned its back on him because secularists have voted 51 to 49 for a particular project? I, I, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to uh, associate yourself a little bit with the, with the Erastian spirit. But I mean, that's, that is total and utter capitulation. Well, that's kind of where the Orthodox and the Western Church differ. The Orthodox understand that governments will come and go, that kings will come and go, that, you know, they'll, they'll come and they'll die off. And the church will always be there. The church will always have the same message from day one to, to the, the second coming of Christ. The it's Western, about salvation. Yeah, and the Western Church is much different. The Western Church thinks they have to get along with every administration, with every uh, government, with every king, um, that there has to be a, a point where 
uh, they like us enough to let us be here. And I think I th the two. Go ahead. Go on. Well, the two problems the Western Church has had is 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 the first one is one that um, the Russians have also had, which is giving in giving way to nationalism, mm -hmm. uh, cozying up to the state because the state is always right. The, the Russian, the Orthodox, um, have a poor history in terms of uh, of submitting to nationalism. But the alternative one, the one we're faced with now, is a kind of socialist utopianism. What um, we appear not to believe in the kingdom of heaven strongly enough. Uh, so we'll build the kingdom of heaven on earth, which That's is right. what socialism and, and communism want to do. Uh, and at the moment, the whole of the Church of England appears, the hierarchy of the Church of England appears committed to that view. But what Kirill was saying was, you won't even get to be the church if you don't stop them closing you down. Uh, and therefore you have to speak out in order to maintain the integrity of being the church in the public place. And that's the point where Welby doesn't appear to get it uh, and says, well, we'll just go along with the democratic majority. Melanie Phillips in The Times, uh, as I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but she, she wrote this very powerful article saying, you don't understand progressive secularism. Uh, it, it is luring you into a false alliance. And once you've um, cozied up to it, it'll spit you out and shut you down. And, and that's, we know, it's quite clear that's exactly what's going to happen. And the only antidote for that is to the church to speak out fearlessly into the public place on behalf of salvation and, and the, the, the moral purity that, that the human beings are called to with the promise of repentance when we, we fail until we're shut up, but, but not to give that up in order to offer political advice to a utopian party. And this is 1920s all over again. Socialism yeah. and communism can only flourish when there is no dissent. Um, the church has always been dissent. Common sense, rational logic has been dissent. And that's why to take care of dissent, we had to lose a hundred million people uh, over the hundred years of socialism and communism. And now we're gonna return to that because people really forget their history. Well, they do. And one of the, in, the, in the debates in England at the moment, there are a number of uh, ethical programs on the radio and television. And you keep on hearing the progressives saying, you know, we believe in the capacity of human beings to improve themselves and, and to, to morally get better. And then sensible people like Peter Hitchens and Melanie Phillips uh, or even Gavin Ashenden <laughs> trying to jump on the bandwagon and say, you know, there is no evidence in the last century where we... Where, where, where the state sacrificed hundreds of millions of people, there is no evidence we have managed to uh, improve ourselves. And that's one of the reasons why, as Christians, we say we're made in God's image, but we're flawed and we need help. Uh, and that's what the offer of salvation is intended to do. Um, but we do need to go on speaking it out into a society that, that would prefer to remain deaf and then would rather close us down. So we have to be as courageous as we can. Uh, amen, Gavin. All right, well, that's it for today's report. Um, oh, my daughter is texting, ask what's for dinner. <laughs> it's way too early for that. <laughs> I think we're having turkey leftovers. I assure you, turkey sandwiches for at least a week. Um, <laughs> got some leftover pumpkin pie, uh, all those wonderful treats that we, we buy too much of on, on Thursday Thanksgiving. Gavin, you have a great week, and we'll catch you soon. I'm Gavin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and you've been patiently listening to episode 347 of Anglican Unscripted. And the revolution, fortunately, is still a little delayed. It certainly is. We should call this, you know, this episode we called Inside Anglican Baseball. All the details and minutia of what Anglicans do wrong. And hopefully they, they will take a little heed to the advice of the, the Orthodox Church in this. We will. Bless you, Kevin. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you.